15,371.2 feet. That's 15,371. We're releasing approximately 70 CFS, of which approximately 42 CFS is going to XL Energy for deliveries in the Jackson Reservoir, uh, pursuant to our agreement with them. Union Reservoir was down from full uh, approximately 750 acre feet, and we're releasing 7 CFS from that reservoir. Uh, Longmont is storing some of the CBT quota water in the local storage at this time, more specifically in the Pleasant Valley Reservoir and Union Reservoir for future irrigation use. And we plan to still plan to carry over the maximum carryover amount available to us next year of our CBT. So that's all I have. Any questions for us? I, I do have one, Wes. So if you're making 42 CFS release for Excel, um, how does that, I mean, typically you try to get as much out of the bottom end of the system for meeting those obligations. I mean, so is it, that's the limiting factor is how much effluent you have? Is there, I mean, really the, the thought is, is to release as much out of the lower system that you can't treat, but if you're releasing out of button rock, that is treatable water. So I'm just kind of curious how that plays out through the season. So, we have an agreement that each year we um, uh, trade Excel for CDT water, and then and then in turn we provide them fully consumable water. Um, the uh, Excel was asking if they could. Um, so normally they would take a small delivery on a per daily uh, per day basis, a couple CFS, for um, to make the most efficient deliveries they were asking for more of a sludge. So in a two week period, receiving about a thousand acre feet. So our sources to be able to satisfy that delivery request falls on either Union Reservoir or in Budnock. Had we taken it out of Union, we would then would have had a thousand acre foot hole in Union that we'd have to refill. And it's very difficult to fill Union because it's an off channel reservoir. Uh, button rocks are being on channel, it's much easier for us to fill in the spring because we can put a lot of water in there in a short period of time. So the, uh, the point is that, yes, we're delivering 42 CFS. We don't have nowhere near that coming out of the wastewater treatment plant in our effluent. And what is coming out of the wastewater treatment plant is fully consumable. In addition to the small amount that we have, which is about three CFS out of Union, on Longmont's behalf, is going to other lease obligations and uh, requirements of Longmont. So we felt um, kind of in summary that to get this thousand acre feet, it made more sense to get out of Button Rock than it did out of Union, so that it can be more easily and quickly replaced next year's in the runoff. So, so the there's a thousand acre feet that's coming from the upper end of the system. Correct. Is the balance met by either effluent or non-treatable sources through Longmont system up? I guess I'm trying to understand in terms of the overall water supply uh -huh. balancing. Obviously, if it's water out of the wastewater plant that can't be treated, you know, that, and you're getting CBT in return, it's a net benefit. Whereas if you're supplying a thousand acre foot of butt rock that could have been treated, you're not getting that net benefit to the, the system. Yeah. So I'm just trying to kind of understand that. So I guess the bottom line is the trade beyond the thousand acre feet that you're releasing. Is that primarily a whole consumable effluent or union reservoir? Those sources. Both of Both those two sources. Okay. So yeah, those are those are making up the remainder of our requested deliveries. And then what will likely happen? The start of the new water year, on November first, XL will come back down to something two or three CFS, and those releases will probably be made up out of the wastewater treatment plant, which will have a higher return flow credit factor, so we can use that, and then any adjustments that we need to make for releases of union. Okay. And if, if we were in a drought circumstance, mm -hmm. and would that probably be that you maybe would make the release out of Union in that situation because... It depends. I mean, we, we have to keep... There's, there's several things that we're considering in, the, in, the, um, in our operations of, of utilizing all of our available sources. Again, we have um, a thousand acre feet would probably take a minimum of a month of filling off the oligarchy. And so, depending upon the, the, um, the capacity of the dish to carry that water, in addition to the oligarchy shareholders, we have to kind of keep that into, into 
uh, consideration. Right. Um, it's hard for an irrigation ditch that was built to run seasonally to have to run year round. Right. And so we're taking that into consideration, but probably the most, the, the foremost consideration in this instance is the ability to put in a significant amount of water in a short period of time in the bud drop. So yeah, if we were into a drought, we'd have to weigh those. We really are utilizing both ends of our system, the lower end and the upper end. But we felt in this case, it made much more sense to sure. use the upper end, even with that slightly more uh, transit loss that we would experience. Yeah. And, and during a drought, um, keep in mind, the agreement with Gasco limits the maximum out they can request absent our permission for right. eight CFNs, which is usually deliverable out of our waste water field. So it kind of squeezes so, them into that requirement on something they could be met via the waste water field. Exactly. So, so in a drought, we probably wouldn't agree to a short term 1,000 acre foot release right. that would came a couple. Further deplete union as opposed to, let's say, yeah, uh, eight, eight, eight or ten CFS. Right. Um, we'll we'll under just a okay. what, what was the reason for the large request? So, Excel each year again we do a we do a trade. And they give us a certain amount of CD, uh, acre foot amount of CBT, and then we pledge to make available that same amount. So they can take deliveries of that at their own schedule, and there it's part of our agreement and. The typical daily maximum is 8 CFS. They would like to put water in Jackson Reservoir so that they can have it available for their use later on. But if they take it in slow amount and small amounts over a long period of time, you just don't realize that water in the reservoir. It's a long ways down and you lose it through the, the conveyance and the transit loss and so forth. So it's much, it's much more beneficial for them to get a slug so they can realize a greater percentage of that water. It's our obligation to deliver the water stops at the um, the outfall of Union Reservoir. So about Sandstone Ranch, they they shoulder the burden of any losses from there down to where they take it <coughs> to Jackson Reservoir. And so it's it's kind of just a everybody tries to position to the best that they can forecast of getting water, wondering whether or not you're going to come into priority or not. And there's a lot of things that are involved, but. Essentially, it is to make more efficient use of the water that they're entitled to. And do they do that on an annual basis? So normally, they normally they haven't taken a, a, a big slug. Occasionally, they have. Normally, they would wait, and you know they would wait until November, sometimes January, and then they would say, okay, I want you to start releasing this, for example, five CFS for the next three months, yeah. and then we would do that. So in a way, what this might do, time will tell, is that. By taking the slug, they may choose not to take any in the month of November and December, perhaps. And in so doing there, it may actually result in long month to long month's benefit because we wouldn't have those commitments to deliver them water during the winter time. There's there has been occasion where they haven't taken their full amount. So they, they just request how much they want and we make it available to them. And so I believe that this might be one of those circumstances where it's, it, that may occur, and, and in so doing, it would be in long much best interest yeah. to do this. So, so it's part of the reason they're wanted it this late because there was no call earlier in the season, so they didn't need as much, and then they're left with this on the balance sheets, and then trying to run it to Jackson. To I believe that's that's a part of it. I I really didn't have a discussion as to why they wanted it, other than to say. They wanted to try to make arrangements with them. And I guess in that regard, if they run it to Jackson, they have it available, it may reduce the amount that they want to do on the trade this upcoming next year. It, it very well may. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks for humoring me. Good yeah. understanding. Any, questions? Any other questions? All right. Uh, I'm going to derail it for a little bit there. All right. Thank you. Um, we're on to item five, which is um, public invited to be heard and a special presentation. Yes. Uh, from St. Graham and Left Hand Water Conservancy District. So. All right, you can look at me or I have a few slides uh, here to give you guys an update on the stream management plan and the 7 8 ballot initiative. I'm Scott Griebling, I'm with the district. I just started about six months ago. So if anything I say is historically inaccurate, please feel free to jump in. I've done my best to get all the details from Sean and all of that. So if you can go to the next slide, please. 
So some quick history, the district was created back in the 70s to develop some large reservoirs, particularly Coppin Top, and that was right towards the end of the era of big dams, and that was pretty fiercely opposed. And so it never got built, and the district had to kind of find something else to, uh, other ways to contribute to the basin, and they decided to develop an augmentation program, and that is still in existence today. And in the floods of 2013 is really when, at least from what I understand, the, the way that the, the basin interacted on water really took on a very, a much more collaborative effort. Everyone had to work together during the flood recovery. And really strong partnerships were built during that time, strong collaborative partnerships. And from that came the stream management planning process. So in uh, 2015, that started and the district led the stream management plan, and from that plan uh, developed a series of basin-wide goals that everybody agreed to, all of the stakeholders and collaborators agreed to, and it also identified the need for additional funding to achieve some of those goals, and that's the, that birthed a 7 a dog initiative. And it passed. It passed in 2020 with, uh, you know, thanks to everyone's support, and the, the city was certainly a strong supporter of that, so. Uh, we all get to celebrate that win, and now it's time to get to work. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, with that, the, the question is, you know, how are we as the district going about implementing that work? And a quick reminder of the four goals, the four basin-wide goals that came out of the stream management plan up there. You see water quality, there's a flow goal, water management, and a habitat goal. And those all were critical elements that were identified in that plan and the district took those and made them relatable to more relatable to the voters and in, in the way that we phrase them for the 7a ballot initiative so if you can go to the next slide please there's some language that was in the 7a ballot initiative and it identifies some very similar goals so water quality healthy rivers and streams uh, safeguarding and conserving drinking water supplies for both communities as well as food production and also protecting forests so identifying that we need to keep our watersheds healthy in that regard and you know there's 68 percent of voters voted yes so this was very uh, very popular within the district and it was very encouraging to see the, the level of support that water received from, from everyone in the district. If you go to the next slide, please. So what we have done is taken, kind of combined those SMP goals with what was stated in the stream, in the 7 8 ballot initiative to develop and, and combined it a little bit with some of the district's own priorities to develop this five point plan. This is really what we are using to guide our implementation of the 7 8 ballot initiative. It's an interconnected plan. So all of these points, as I'm sure you guys are all well aware, water connects all aspects of life, but this work really goes hand in hand. So water quality relates to maintaining healthy rivers and creeks and also relates to having good water, uh, drinking water supplies, and that connects to storage as well as food production. Uh, I'll highlight a couple specific projects. So if you go to the next slide, please you'll see that storage is still on there. So going back to the district's original creation to develop reservoirs, but rather than you know big on-channel reservoirs, we're looking at a slightly different approach. So we're looking at what uh, we're, we're liking to call creek improvement facilities, which is a, kind of a concept that, I, that recognizes that we want to develop storage for multi-purpose storage projects for a variety of benefits. So, storage for the sake of storage and in dry years, but also storage that can help enhance flows for recreation and the environment. Some of the types of storage buckets that we're looking at are existing structures, rehabbing existing structures, expanding ex existing structures. We're also looking at potential new storage. And it's almost, it, I think it's 100% off channel with this. And we are just in the start, uh, kind of the 
high level feasibility stage of identifying good spots to pursue and to, to look at to look into with further detail. And next slide, please. So another big project that we've been contributing both funding to and also participating in is wildfire mitigation and pretreatment. And I've highlighted maintaining healthy rivers and creeks, but this really touches a lot of aspects of those five point plans. Watershed health is critical kind of to all aspects of both water quality and our ability to get drinking water and also to some extent um, growing, growing food and agriculture and all of that with having good clean water sources available to us. Some of what we have been doing and we've been working with the Left Hand Watershed Center and also the Longmont and Boulder Valley Conservation District on both mitigation efforts for the Cowwood fire, so doing some mulching and seeding, supporting some of that work, in addition to pretreatment. So developing uh, education and outreach for the public and also strategizing to see how can we best maintain our forests to best protect our watersheds. There are a bunch of other things that we are looking at that we have. Some we have been started this past year and other things we're looking at, excited to jump into in 2022 and beyond. We're uh, stream gauging and instrumentation is certainly something that came up during the stream management plan process and is very much in the district's wheelhouse. So we hope to be implementing some more stream gauges, uh, soil health, working with local agriculture and supporting soil health tests to improve uh, growers' knowledge of their of their soil health and how they can uh, increase both their yields and decrease their inputs. Uh, flow targets, so looking at how can we best manage our flows in an integrated fashion and focus primarily on some key dry up spots. And then also passage projects we've been working, uh, the city has been working hand in hand on several of those and we've been trying to support kind of with that overarching approach to when we look at, when we talk about passage projects, so fish passage, sediment passage, all of that, how can we position ourselves to have that be a ditch company driven rather than um, you know, externally driven and a project being brought to a ditch company, the ditch companies themselves really driving that design of that. That's all I have, but I'd be happy to take questions if you guys have anything else. Hey Scott, any questions for Scott in the presentation? I've got one. Yeah. Um, in terms of the kind of forest health, yeah. and one of the issues that comes up is public versus private lands. It yes. sounds like you're trying to partner with other entities, but you know, public lands in particular, mm -hmm. do you have thoughts? Because a, a lot of times that's the majority of the land, yet you may only be able to access or do programs on private. Just do you, can you get into that a little bit? Yeah, so we've been working with the St. Brain and, or the St. Brain Forest Health Partnership, and it is, they're doing work on both public and private lands. And my understanding is that they, they do have federal and state partners on board in that effort. Mm -hmm. I thought of one, Scott. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm Scott. I'm Scott, yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's Scott Pollock, too. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, uh, it's a big. Uh, I mean, it's a big deal to get new storage in Colorado. Yeah. You know, I mean, look what we just went through mm -hmm. with the Chimney Hall Reservoir. And it was a big deal a few years ago to allow homeowners to have uh, rain barrels. Yeah. Uh, so when you say moderate sized local storage, what, is, what do you have to go through to get that approved? That's a great question. And we and that's part of our looking at opportunities that don't have a very onerous permitting process. If there's any way that we can kind of thread that needle to find opportunities mm -hmm. that you know we can ex increase existing structures or rehab existing structures, or you know pull together with other entities and look at possibilities of you know where can storage be expanded. So there are there, there are possibilities. Yes. And none of them are sure things. Exactly. Yeah, and we are we're just at the start of that process. I mean, just to put a finer point on that. I mean, we're talking like 
gravel pits and, and such, right? I mean, that, like that's one idea, for example. Exactly. So just to put like a little bit more exactly. visual piece to this, I guess. Yeah, they, you know, we had kind of done some uh, Google Earth map exercises where we looked at the whole basin and say, you know, what are, working with Mark McLean and Darren Alt on this and using, um, they've got a great depth of knowledge there. And so saying, you know, from your guys' perspective as well as other, uh, some of our board members and other people in the community talk to Ken a little bit about this. Um, you know, where are opportunities in, in your guys' minds for, for potential storage? And then as we develop a very large list, uh, a lot of things fall off of it quickly and we can start focusing in on a few key spots. Okay. Any other questions? Go ahead, Allison. Could you talk a little bit more about the flow charting space? Yeah. So the stream management plan identified uh, some critical habitat or some critical stream reaches, and one of them was the lines to Longmont, where it dries up at several points during the year, and there's also some native, uh, endangered fish species. So looking at ways to support flows through there, through the, both adding water to the creek and also looking at if we can op reoperate things, if we can kind of get find ways to to bring rock water through that reach that benefits everybody or that we can you know, collaboratively work to, to minimize the amount of dry up time. And that's, that's one example. And more broadly looking at ways of either increasing flows in the river or again reoperating re if, if possible to benefit things like um, you know, kayak. So when there's water events and lions and stuff like that, so if we can have bump up flows a little bit. And there's key times for fish spawning season for rainbows and browns and stuff like that. So if we can increase flows during those times. And how are you exploring those flow targets as far as coming up with those ideal Yes, flows? yes. So we are just on the start of that as well. Um, but working with experts, so working with fish experts and then also recreation to say, in an ideal scenario, what would these species benefit from? And kind of building on top of that and seeing, okay, taking that and looking at what's reasonable and possible and kind of merging those two is the, is the idea at least. It, we'll see where it ends up. And as far as measuring devices, yeah. are there any locations within the current area that you're examining that those could benefit from additional measurement? The stream management plan identified several areas that could use additional um, instrumentation. And we are also looking beyond that to see if there's other spots. So if you guys have spots, I know you guys know the system very well. If there's places that would be helpful to have additional gauging, please let's talk about it. And yeah, I, 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 for years wanted to re-operate uh, the uh, old gauging station that used to be just downstream of Copeland Lake, mm -hmm. North St. Ray. Yeah, on the bridge there? Yeah, okay. on the bridge. The state discontinued that. Mm -hmm. I, I understand why they did. I, I wish they hadn't. I still would like to see it there. So, yeah, um, yeah that's, that's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> But no, there's a lot of them down here where we need to operate, reoperate, and know where water is and isn't. And, uh, so. and that all kind of fits together with the flow targets and you know identifying where storage is most needed and all of that. And, and Allison, one of the things that just because I'm familiar with it, I'm involved in it, <laughs> that, that the district is doing is they're coming up with a playbook for how to do fish passage at um, ditch diversion structures. Um, we've had a couple of them put in that would basically be try to be polite disaster, <laughs> and and because nobody knows how to do it right. And there was one that just went in here not too long ago that just could have been done better, and uh, so. The district has agreed to come up with a playbook. Um, uh, Sean Sutton on the kind of help, help and I, I imagine you're involved in it too, Scott. Yeah. And and uh, I'm, I'm sitting on it for the city. Um, Audrey Butler sitting on it for Boulder County uh, Parks and Open Space. So we're hoping to come up with a document to guide that and actually allow them to move forward. 
to start going again. So yeah, that's some of the efforts we're working on. And Kevin, you're talking, I, I should also mention, we have been in conversation with the city about possible water conservation efforts. So municipal water conservation. We didn't, uh, we didn't come up with anything for this year, but we've been, we are gonna re-engage. I'm looking forward to continuing that conversation to see ways that we can partner with you guys as well. The, um, the gauging, is that primarily oriented towards uh, flow or also water quality? Mostly flow. So the left-hand watershed center has, is doing a bunch of monitoring, more quality-focused monitoring. So we're partnering. The kind of implementation of the stream management plan is on a high level, taking a, an adaptive management approach is, is really what the left-hand watershed center, the, the mechanism through which they are wanting to move forward and monitoring and getting more data is certainly key in the successful implementation of the plan. And so identifying that, you know, we there are several things that we know and several things that we can start tackling now, but we also need to keep learning and have uh, have that learning inform future decision making down the road. Okay. Are there other questions for Sean? Go ahead, Alice. Um, what do you next steps and the timeline for those steps? So we have seven day funding uh, for 10 years. So this is 2021 was the first of the tap. And so we are trying to get as much done as we can. Uh, so some of these projects we have kicked off. And the so the creek improvement facility we've gone through, we're wrapping up the kind of high level feasibility and are gonna start narrowing that list and developing some preliminary designs. And as we select projects, you know, start construction as soon as we can with those. Uh, the forest health, the wildfire mitigation and pretreatment is happening as we speak. The flow targets, that process is kicking off this next year. So a lot of stuff, um, we started what we could this past year and we're kicking off a lot more this next year. So it's very active, I guess, if that answers your question. So is the thought, kind of Scott, you're studying, but if you see opportunities, you're trying to fund and kind of get those moving in the, not waiting for the overall plan, you're, you're trying to implement what you can in the end. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, great. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah, thank you guys. Thanks, Scott. I'm going to head out here unless there's anything else. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, did we have, um, that was under public vote to be heard, um, other than no, yeah, no public vote to be heard, no other presentation? No. All right, we're on to item six, which is agenda revisions and submission of documents. Anything there? You know, I don't have any revisions. I do have one picture I'm going to show you later in the meeting about uh, uh, button off, but other than that, I have no revisions. Okay, thank you. On to seven and all we have is seven B, which is the Longmont Business Center. Next yeah, so this is an information item only, but uh, for the board's information, Longmont Business Center, B flat J plus A and A B is a six point one four seven acre parcel located east of South Florida Street and North Dry Creek Drive. Um, this particular plat was a portion of the Longmont Business Center final plat that was reviewed by the board back in March of 1999. All the historic water rights have been transferred, all the raw water assets have been satisfied, and this present year compliance. But uh, according to the, to the uh, raw water department policy board, was going to look at these, and so that's why it's in front of you. Okay. And any questions or comments? This is just the informational item. Just so any questions, comments for Wes on this item? Okay. I don't see any, so okay. thanks, Wes. Keep moving. Um, so we're under 8A, which is the 2022 Legislative Guiding Water Principles. Okay. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, we have the uh, Guiding Water Principles for Legislative Affairs before you. This is an annual um, review of our Guiding Water Principles uh, for legislative purposes. Um, once they're approved by water board, this is just kind of a water part of legislation. Um, these are combined with um, other information in the city manager's office. 
annually takes to city council. Uh, generally around December is when they take that to city council. And that uh, it, basically what it does is it guides staff when, um, when the flurry of legislation comes in in January, it, it, you know, you can't take 2,000 bills <laughs> to have uh, city council look at them. So this gives us the guiding the guidance of, you know, kind of what bills should we bring forward? And if, if we have comments, you know, how should they be um, uh, looked at? And, and so, uh, you know, we review these for a number of years, so they're generally pretty good. Um, there is one guiding water principle that I thought I would bring to your attention. I think when we wrote it years ago, it made a lot of sense, but um, I might, we might consider slightly changing it. And uh, I really shouldn't have these as bullets. I should have them numbered because <laughs> I can't say bullet number nine, and it's not numbered, but about two thirds of the way down the very first page. We have one, um, it says all Colorado water users must share in solving Colorado's water resource problems with the cost to meet the water needs of water users being paid solely by those benefiting from the project or effort. Um, that made a lot of sense and it has made a lot of sense over the years. Um, and I've, I've, I've been thinking about that one in particular right now though and we may want to slightly tweak that. Um, as you may remember, uh, recently at one of the general elections, there was a, a bill pa uh, initiative passed that um, set up sports betting and it turns out and and the funding kind of the i'll call it the taxes or the portion that the state keeps on the sports betting was directed towards um, developing and furthering the, the state of colorado's the colorado water plan and part of the colorado water plan is developing water supplies for the future um, a lot of the funding, of course, will go to generally, I think it'll be used at, at the state level to generally move the Colorado Water Plan forward. Uh, but I do believe as part of that, there, there will probably be some, uh, there will be some grant opportunities for development of projects and, and other activities that are listed under the Colorado Water Plan. And so um, it probably makes sense to be, to keep an eye on that. And, and so um, I, I guess if I, if I were to look at this, I'd just strike solely off that. <laughs> I think it's fine that it says that the water needs, uh, that to meet the water needs being paid by those benefiting but you might take the word solely off because I, I do believe there is an opportunity for that. Um, turns out, I guess people in Colorado bet more <laughs> on sports than they anticipated. There's certainly more money coming in on that sports betting. Uh, I, I think it partially, I think surrounding states, people fly into DIA or they drive into the state until they get a cell tower <laughs> that pings off a a cell tower in the state of Colorado, then they put their bet and they go back home. Like literally, some people fly into DIA, place a sport bet, and then fly out because uh, you get cheap flights into DIA, I guess, from Texas. A lot of them are coming from Texas. So, um, well, well, for whatever the reason, I don't know, but there's a lot of sports betting going on, and so there's a little more money than was anticipated, which is. We'll um, take it. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is what it is. So, but other than that, I think, you know, I think these um, are consistent, but, but hopefully you've had a chance to take a look at it and if you want to change any or, or leave them the same, it is perfectly fine too, so. So I guess two items we can talk to the family. We agree with Ken's kind of recommendation on that, removing solely. And then I guess beyond that, if there's other um, comments or other items that we'd, we'd like to either have changed or added to the list, so. Maybe start with that. Is everybody okay with moving solely from the, that um, bullet regarding the funding um, or who's paying for the benefit of a project, Allison? 
Mr. Chair, I would propose that we both start slowly and add the word remaining. I, I would, yeah, I kind of agree that, that even if solely is missing, then it still kind of infers that, that it is kind of solely still. And so, of course, I'm a lawyer, but, but I would suggest that that's a good plan. I, I think that makes sense. Just saying that they have to be part of the funding source. So, uh, but there's other sources that could help them. I'm, I'm good with that. Any other thoughts? Marcy, we'll put you on. No, <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out where the including goes. Yes. Right. Yeah, it needs to be reworked a little more. Okay, instead of instead of solely the Okay. So it would read: All Colorado water users must share in solving Colorado's water resource problems, with the cost to meet the water needs of water users being paid, including by those benefiting from the project or effort. Is that what you're saying, Allison? Yeah. It, yeah, it could, it could probably be more. Plainly written, but I think that does the job. Okay. Anything else? I've, I've got one, unless anyone else wants to. The only one I guess I see, and I don't know if it's maybe it's mentioned here, is we've had a lot of discussions regarding um, forest fires and either mitigation or prevention measures. And I don't know if we want to make that a specific bullet um, that. You know, Longmont supports um, you know fire mitigation um, and prevention efforts um, for municipal water supplies because it's becoming more and more of a uh, hot topic, and I think there's going to probably be legislation specific to that. I mean, there has been. I think there's going to be more of it. So, uh, just one that was going through my mind as I was reading the list. Do we have anything? Along those lines, presently, I was having to add. Not, not specifically. I think, I think you could infer that from a number of these, but I think it's good to, uh, you know, yeah. The very last bullet does say forest fires, um, but that's during emergency forest fires. Yeah. But yeah, I, I said something like Longmont supports um, legislation to improve forest stewardship efforts in the state. <laughs> For for preventing both the forest and the watershed. Yep. Something like that. Yeah. Does that does that statement Todd? I, I did what you were saying. No, I, I didn't think it did. Just because it, it's kind of specific to just emergency situations. I guess what I'm thinking of, um, Roger, is there's quite a bit of work that needs to be done prior to that, and in terms of forest management and. Um, you know, after the fact, maybe the emergency's gone, but then you're having to do mitigation, so you're protecting water quality that way. So I, I'm just thinking it's a little broader and could maybe be a topic, instead of it being included in an emergency situation, it kind of stands on its own in terms of those activities. But that, that was all I saw. Any other questions or comments? Everybody okay with adding that one? Sounds good. Okay, cool. all right, thank you. Do you have what you need, Ken? Yes. Let's go. We're long, long out support forest stewardship efforts to protect the forest and associated watershed from catastrophic fire events. Yeah, you heard. Yeah. Let us support those kind of bills and encourage them. Okay. That's great. Yeah, I apologize. May I yeah. add to that language was proposed? Um, not just the catastrophic forest fires, but the resulting. Mudslides and yeah, water quality impacts. Yeah. Cool. That's that's a good point. All right, um, so we keep moving. We're on the. Uh, do you need? Do you need a motion to approve those? Or yeah, or? I, if you could, please. Sure. Okay. We'll be sending that on to council. All right. So with those two changes that we talked about, and um, when is this going to council? Is this pretty soon? Um, generally, it goes in December. So I, we 
I mean, why? Sometimes we don't. I would probably a lot of time to even bring it back in well, that's November. I mean, if they bring it back in November, we nice have look. the actual language we could vote on it there if that works. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, as long as that works, timing, mean, let's yeah. do that. Yeah. All right, um, so moving on, we're on item 9A is the cash and move policy review. Wes? Yeah, let's go. So, um, as the board will recall, we've been talking about um, uh, cash and move policy um, following the city council's direction back in July. Um, we last spoke uh, last month and we had some input from the city attorney's office. Um, since that time, a lot of resources staff has had conversations with the city attorney's office and other departments uh, within the city of Longmont. We, um, we don't have anything specific to bring back to you this month, other than to let you know that we're working on um, some uh, potential language um, and, and also um, multiple scenarios for setting the fee. Um, some of the things we're working on though, that are coming as a byproduct of those meetings with uh, staff. Um, we've initiated discussions with Northern Water concerning the opportunity to review the Windy Gap Permitting Project firm yield ratio analysis, and that's that's a pretty that's a pretty big deal. That's something that's going to take some time, but we've started that work. Um, we're working with the Business and Environmental Services on various financial policies and their funding mechanisms. So. Next month, we're anticipating having um, a representative from, their, from them to come and give you uh, public works and natural resources, if you will, 101 on uh, things such as the Windy Gap uh, Parent Project, Windy Gap Firming Project, TAP fee collections, the Cash and Lou Fee Fund, Windy Gap Special Assessments, all those types of things to kind of help you keep in, uh, in context how those things are received how they're applied, and I think that'll be helpful in, in, in your overall um, uh, recommendation to city council on this. Um, we've, um, we're working to collect uh, prior Windy Gap uh, parent project sales information. We're gonna include that in the quarterly review. Um, you, you, the board asked for that, so we're gonna work on collecting that. And then uh, finally, like I said earlier, um, developing those scenarios to help set the fee for cash and lieu. So probably, um, I'm, I'm guesstimating there'll be three or four different ways that the board might entertain um, setting that. And uh, so that information will come in your November and your November packet. And then hopefully at that meeting, you'll be able to make some decisions that could be applied towards our quarterly review in December. Okay, so any questions, comments on that? You know, I, and maybe you got some information from uh, as far as looking at different cash and lien costs from other entities. That was in one of our minutes, we had a cash and lien average for Northern communities somewhere around $41,000. I was trying to figure out if specifically what communities like ours, like Fort Collins or Loveland, what are their cash and lien numbers? And, and how do they arrive at something that's much, that's much different than where ours is. I'm trying to sync these things together and I need to I don't understand why they got where they got. Yeah, sure. Um, and actually, I, that's a really good point because I think one of the things that happens, some some of these questions really originate from not very professional. Why, you know, why, why are why are they doing this and why are we doing this? And um, so um, we just just for facts, <laughs> we did go ahead and pull those numbers. Fort Collins current cash and loo is. 42,518 an acre foot, although they expect that to go up to uh, 68,200 on November 2nd. <laughs> so that's that's quite soon. Um, Loveland is at 40,150, and Greeley is at 36,500. Um, 
most of those are primarily because, of course, they um, are, are using um, CBT as part, at least part of all of their um, comparison, or their cash flow comparison. You know, some entities like Little Thompson Water District doesn't really have a cash flow. They just say you got to go get CBT, and you know, some of the small rural districts. And so, right now, CBT is about sixty thousand a unit, which is about eighty thousand later book. So it's pretty high, and, and and really they don't. They just hey, you want you know you want a tap from us? That's what you got to go get. So that's pretty high. Um, Fort Collins, I find a little bit interesting because for years we were, you know, we had a real, what I'll call a, a reasonable cash flow fee. Um, other cities were around ours, but um, Fort Collins was always way lower than us. Way lower. Way lower. They were six thousand five hundred dollars an acre foot up until the last, just not too long ago, and, and so they were always. They were the one that was always underneath us, and I don't know why they decided to change their policy. I, I, I I'll, I'll try to find that out, but really they've gone from six thousand to sixty-eight thousand. <laughs> That's going to be a shock. Um, just add in a zero. Yeah, they just <laughs> added a zero. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that was the easiest way to do it. Just add a zero. You got it. Um, Although I caveat a little bit, I, I don't generally worry too much about what Fort Collins does because they don't serve much of their city with water. They serve about the number of citizens, about half of it, but they serve the old part of Fort Collins in the middle. All the growth area on the south and all the growth area in the north and northeast are rural domestics. So area-wise, they only serve about one-third of the city of Fort Collins, which is Okay, but it's interesting. I wouldn't want that situation. But, um, that that's really scary to me as a water provider, um, because you're dependent upon rural domestics you know, for your community. So, did you pull the numbers on the rural domestics? I haven't pulled those yet. I just had time to do these. Actually, I, I thought that was an excellent question I, we got. Um, we actually have. It was actually started by the city of Loveland, and I. Stole from years ago. <laughs> we have a pretty complete spreadsheet, but it's way out of date now. So we'll update it for, for the November meeting. We have a complete spreadsheet of a lot of the, you know, all the way from Boulder, Louisville, Lafayette to Fort Collins, mm -hmm. to Greeley, and a number of the rural domestics. There are raw water policies, not only what it is, but how they set it, because everybody's different. And that's that's one of the things I always caution people is um, don't just compare a number. That doesn't be any good at all. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, if I may, because um, the reason that we brought this before you guys is because we were being questioned by the public mm -hmm. and also because as far as the council is concerned, this is very closely tied to our growth policy. Um, so back in the 90s and aughts, Longmont wanted to grow and approved a lot of, of annexations because we could and we didn't want to put barriers up to do it. Well now, we're about out of annexations though. There are not that many more um, plots that can be brought in. Uh, and we have other sources of, of revenue now, which was much more, much less true back in those decades. Um, so there are people who want to discourage Longmont's growth a lot, and there are people who just want to be careful with Longmont's growth and be sure that when we annex some something that we're doing it for the right reason and not doing it just to be doing it. Um, and I think you will, you may remember that we have uh, sent a couple of annexation re uh, requests back to the developer or property owner and said, Nah, Longmont doesn't need this. We would like to annex you, but we want you to come up with a better plan that's more aligned with the city's vision. And so 
if the answer that comes back is, well, all right, we have more risk than we used to have, and, and button rock may be riskier than it used to be, and, um, but we're still going to peg the button rock, they're going to say, well, does that take into account all of the policy matters that we have before us? Um, so I think that in addition to the pricing that, uh, of, you know, comparing to other cities, we should at least look at the risk that um, Button Rock is not going to perform the way we expected it to. I'm sorry, that's Chimney Hollow. Chimney Hollow, right, Chimney Hollow is not going to perform the way we expect it to because, uh, you know, nobody knows right now. Um, and there, there are, uh, you know, all the existing diversions even uh, are at risk because of, of the lower basin distress that we see. Um, so I, I don't think just a, a, a financial analysis is going to be sufficient. And be prepared, depending on who is reviewing this, because it's not going to be before November 2nd, obviously. Um, you know, the, the way it's going to be looked at by the council could be quite different. So, um, yeah. And the what other do you mean by that, Mark? Well, because like, of the change of the member you're talking about? Because, because the policies could change, you know. So, um, just like, just like Boulder, you know, Boulder's, um, Boulder wanted to be surrounded by open space, but then they resisted um, changing their land use codes to allow for more urban density. So now they don't have any place to grow. Um, and there is a debate going on in the city council, and there will be a debate again next term, too, as to, well, you know, does Longmont really want to um, push on, on the number of, of homes and, and meters and so on that we expect to have it build out? Or do we want to keep that the same as it has been in terms of, of your planning. Um, and I have honestly no way of predicting right now. I mean, the, the people running for the at-large seats in particular are not a known quantity. Um, so I'm just saying be prepared in terms of having, having weighed uh, all those possible factors. Well, Go ahead. Well, my point is, I mean, you say just don't look at the numbers. It's hard not to look at the numbers. Oh, I didn't say don't look at no, the numbers. Don't I, no, just look I'm, at the no, numbers. I'm, but I'm saying the difference between our rates and the other side. I have a hard time understanding why the big square. I mean, it's big. Two and three times. I just don't. So maybe I can take a little shot at that. And Marsh, I, so I watched the, the original council meeting yeah. and the public invited to be heard. And the, the original call that prompted some of this discussion was coming from the place, as I heard it, that, oh, we have way low cash and loot rates and these other guys are way higher. And they're inferring that because of that difference, Longmont is subsidizing development. That, that we are, in we're subsidizing development at the cost of the water. The water rates are going up to help kind of fund. That was kind of the inference that was made in that, that comment. You didn't hear it that way. Well, I I, I think it could it could be heard that way. Um, that I mean, certainly they are. We have kept our cash in with these low because we wanted to encourage development, and that was the policy all along. The next question is, since annexation is not going to be as much of a driver, um, do we? You know, is is that? The thing, or are we just leaving money on the table? Well, but, but I, I think at least my view of it is we're looking at it. What's the cost of service? What, what does it cost us to develop an acre foot for new development? And okay. right now, the the project, and this will be a comment I've got because as I we went, I listened to the rest of that conversation. Something else was going through my mind, but yeah. the cost is we've got when we got 
when you got permitting costs that now have been the, the project's been let, you yeah. know, we've got hard costs. We have a pretty good idea what the cost of that reservoir is going to, going to yes. be. So based on that, in the firming ratio, which we'll get into the risk in a second, yeah. maybe a, a, an adjustment factor. But but we know, you know, what those costs are. So what is the cost of new development in the context of the cost of adding one acre foot of supply? And that's what we're trying to set it at. If we and we can add these risk factors, and I've been the one kind of talking about some of that, and I agree that we need to do that mm -hmm. if when you get firming has more risk than maybe the other supplies within the city of Longmont's portfolio. But I think we need to have that conversation in that context. What I don't like is if we're saying, hey, when you get firming is you know eighteen thousand, maybe we have a twenty percent you know factor until Northern can do more modeling and we feel better about whatever that percentage is. What I don't like is okay, somebody's at thirty or forty thousand an acre foot. Mm -hmm. We're leaving money on the table. No, we're not. We're pricing it at what the cost of service is. If we're saying, hey, we want to bump that up, under what rationale? Well, no, because leaving money on the table is not the same as losing money. Right. In other words, this revenue could be um, in the city for in the you know in the city's funds for. Um, risk mitigation for disaster recovery for a lot of things that the water fund can pay for um, and if we are not gouging you know if we're not at par if we're at parity with other cities around then um, I don't you know that would be leaving money on the table if we if we stayed low for no reason when in fact we have we have ways to use the money that would benefit the city. And and some of those march in my mind, maybe beyond what I view as maybe the water boards <laughs> role here. I, I view our role is what is the cost to add an acre foot of per meal to the the water system, and that's what we've been recommending in terms of the cash and loo. And I think we do need to consider in, in what's the additional risk or how do we maybe add that so that the acre foot that's being added with when you got firming is on par with the rest of the, the system. I, I think that makes sense. But if it's beyond that, I, I don't know how, how do we as a water board have that conversation of, you know, I guess I, I have a hard time if we're saying somebody's at $70,000 an acre foot, so let's bump it up. It seems like we need to justify and rationalize what are the things that go into whatever that cash and loo number is to make sure that the development's paying its own way and if it has risk factors or whatever. But beyond that, I'm, I'm just having a hard time putting and, my finger on any of that. And and I don't think that it is necessarily the water board's um, job to, you know, peg the final number. Instead, what you should be bringing forward is is what's the, um, what are the components of cost? Right. You know, so the cost per acre foot the risk. Well, so what? It, what would happen if, you know, the worst case scenarios happen with, with um, the Chimney Hollow Reservoir, and we had to go buy CBT water. What if we couldn't buy CBT water? You know, what are our, our options? You know, do we have to build a, a treatment plant in a real hurry to be able to, you know, the pump back system to be able to use um, our other. Um, are other sources of less pristine water, right. um, then the council doesn't have any way of, it, within its own knowledge of, of uh, deciding what those costs are. So, you know, that if you bring back the Lego bricks of, of contingencies, well, what if we had to rush to build a, the pump back system? What if we had to buy this many acre feet of CBT for the next 10 years, you know? What if we had to do all those things? And then the council's job is to look what uh, other cities have done and, and make some kind of risk assessment and see how many of those building blocks to stack up into our actual fee and loo. Um, so I, I got, I guess, two comments um, on that. Um, I guess the, the first is the, the other Lego bricks you're talking about. So it, it's the Union Reservoir pump back or, I don't, I, we, we tried to update, you guys tried to update those costs, but but the level of precision of when you get firming costs, 
to if it's a you know we have button rock listed on there we have all these other projects that in my mind are way you know they're, they're just kind of a, a swag if you know, i think we're being kind to the swag by saying that of you know there, there's so many pieces that would have to be put into that before something like that would be able to be built that that i think we're just kind of guesstimating as to what those costs are so, you know, we were kind of comparing, in my mind, apples to oranges. You got a, a firm, we got a bid project, we know what that cost is, and then we're saying, oh, well, let's bump it up to the Union Reservoir Pump Act. I just don't feel a lot of confidence from my perspective after being on the water board for as many years in terms of what those costs are for those other projects, number one. Number two, the what the other projects are, these other cities. So I, I worked in the city of Greeley as a water resource manager for a number of years. Their number is pegged to what they think it's going to cost to do their Terry Ranch project and their other add an acre foot of water supply to their system. Okay, they're at 36,000, they're half of what Longmont is. Why? Because Longmont is down to where we're pretty manageable in terms of we only have to grow this much to build out and we think we can meet it based on the projections with when you get firming. The, the question's going to be, all right, do we have a safety factor or something on there to, to that number? But but my point is, is the basis that they're using is how much does it cost to add an acre foot of firm yield to their system in terms of dollars? And that's what I'm viewing that Longmont is trying to, at least the water board, in my view, we're trying to make the same recommendation to council. The city of Loveland, another point I'll make is city of Loveland, they assume a 100% CBT quota in the last year of a multi-year drought. So you need to take that into account too, is what are their assumptions that lie behind these cash and lieu rates? Because, you know, a little Thompson water district assumes a 50% firm yield number on um, CBT units. You got, you're off by a factor of two between this guy and this guy. So I think you need to make sure, you know, everybody kind of gets caught up in the numbers without understanding the rationale behind them. And, and exactly. Right. And kind of welcome to my world, Todd. This is kind of, you know, I mean, the the people who who finalize the policy are doing exactly right. what you're talking about. You know, we, we have we, we have firm numbers some places and we have swags other places. Right. And you know, we, we're just doing our best. I'm I'm just saying do your best and uh, you know, Longmont has, has been in such a good place, and I don't want to make this last for a long time either, but Long, Longmont has been in such a good place with water for such a long time that it's been a matter of turning the crank. Um, and now, I think things are changing. Um, most people think things are changing now. Um, you know, the Sierra Club has changed their policy from never make new storage because it you know, it, it uh, might yeah, make some species of bacterium go extinct or something if you change the riparian habitats. And now they're saying, well, well, we've got to add storage because there are so many risks out there. You know, and those are, in, those are environmentalists. Um, we're still going to be dealing with the extremist environmentalists who wanted us to cut our consumption in half next year and you know that is a reasonable thing to ask but those are the pressures that we're going to be looking at so that's all i'm saying is is to be the most help look at all the different contingencies that you can um so you know so why fort collins has such a big number i don't know um you, you know it, it could be because um, all those, what did you say, rural? Uh, rural domestics. Rural domestics. Rural domestics. They're, they're pretty high too, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, do they have their, do they have firm supplies or not? Um, and how does that compare to, you know, what goes on, um, what goes on in the, in the other Windy, Windy Gap participants, you know, just yeah. base around us. And I'm a lay person. I haven't been on the water board for eight years, um, but uh, you know, I'm I'm just saying that that turning the crank just with the Windy Gap contingencies is probably 
not sufficient. Um, you know, the land use, how, how many more fees in lieu can we charge? Um, Tom, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say that, so I, this is, these conversations is when I benefit from being the new person, I think, because I come in like almost kind of with, with I don't know, fresh eyes or definitely more kind of naive eyes or something, I guess. But, um, and, and and then also having gone on the raw water tour this, this past month, which by the way, was amazing. Thank you for that. Um, and um, I, I think one thing that gets lost in the numbers is, is basically the kind of, the fact that we're benefiting so much from like the historical kind of the, the history of our water systems, right? I mean, that, that like so many people before us, right? Like really planned for contingencies moving forward and kind of almost kind of pseudo overbuilt the system in a way and, and kind of, you know, really prepared us for where we are today, right? And so if you just focus on those numbers and, and not the broader kind of, uh, the, the broader approach, right, to setting those numbers. What gets lost is that we're in relatively decent shape, and so as a result, then our the, the amount to build out more more water is is costs us less than it would somebody else who is basically always operating in crisis, right? I mean, if you take it to the extreme, mm -hmm. and so so the idea, I mean, the, the, the thought that I or, or, or perhaps what I think maybe needs to get out a little bit better is perhaps a little bit more of that history, right? If it's the public, for example, that's kind of pressing for, for additional costs, maybe there's just not quite as much understanding of the history of, of the contingency plan that really did go into all of this from a historical perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, I tell that story all the time. I'm sure. You know, in terms in terms of of saying, um, Longmont's not in the same drought. Even when we're in drought, we're not in the same drought yeah. as as you know, who are those places down south? Parker. You know, when Parker's in a drought. They're in a drought. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, um, and so we do tell that story yeah. all the time. Yeah. Um, and so there is, it's, it's basically a political question. Do we be, do we make it easy on the people annex, wanting to annex into the city because we can, or do we make the people who are annexing into the city help us to, to stay in that prudent place? Um, you know, that's ultimately gonna be what the decision is. Well, I think I believe I'm just going to say that I think it was made many years ago when this was first brought up. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I think one of the questions that was raised was how much land is actually annexable? I, yeah, and how much was Was mm -hmm. that your thought? Or was that your thought? Well, that's my thought. <laughs> okay. yeah, I mean, no, no, but but no, that, 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 you know, to the mark, I mean, mm -hmm. it depends on what the city is. If it's getting grown up to the point where, and that changes a lot of the dynamic of the mm -hmm. whole thing, mm -hmm. and we're in a whole different spot than other. But and anyway, I, I agree with that because I, so I mean, if we take it to the extreme, right? If we have like one three hundred acre plot that's going to be annexed and subdivided, and we're having this discussion, is is it worth it for for just that? Dot one, right? Now that's to the extreme, right? Mm -hmm. So like, basically, how much are we talking about? Is it five of those? Is it 10 of those? Is it like, we're gonna be doing this into the future? So yeah, we should definitely have this conversation or is it, yeah, so we have, have based on master plan? We have plotted all that out on GIS. We plan on bringing that in November to show you. To the water board. First sure. to the water board, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, keep in mind, it, there, there's two categories. There's one land and annex. There's not much, honestly, a lot of land left to annex, but there's a lot of land left to plant. Okay. So the, the cash and lieu is really, while it sort of is, at, at annexation, you just get us air circle water. When you plant, you have to. So there's a lot of land that's already been annexed. There's more land that's already been annexed that still has to plat versus land that is going to 
annex and then leave it blank. And, but it's easier to see that on a GIS application. And so we'll have that in November. Does that have that whole plan? Does that happen more hand in hand today? Like kind of annexation and platting happen kind of at the same time, or is that still, there's still disconnected time? Yeah. You know, if, if you look at the one we just did today, that came through originally in 1999. Yeah, sure. So ironically, it's the same age as Jimmy Hall, when he got Fermi. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which was 19, started in 1999. So yeah, I can be 20 years late. Okay. So, so when, while, while we're on it, just let me make one point. Yeah. I think it's critical, this point is funny because what you just brought up was going to be the next point I brought up, which is how much is left to go here for these these water providers? The city of Greeley, which when I was there, we were looking at, at growth projections, and at 2050, they were not meeting their full build out. Yeah. So, so my point is, is they got to not just look at we're looking at hey, does too many all meet all our demand? If not, maybe you have to build a small pump back. They're looking at we got to do this and this and this and this. And, and the further out there you go, the more costly those projects get, yes. um, and the more uncertain. So, so my point is, is when we bring it back and we're doing the comparison that we're asking for on the cash and loo, yeah. that has to be part of it too. It of these guys are looking, you know, they've got a big annex area, a lot of potential water growth, and they're going to have to do a lot of projects to get to their build out. Longmont, on the other hand, one has a good system. I think that was a great point. Um, when two, we don't have a lot of growth left overall, and the numbers mm -hmm. that I think Ken's talking about will bear that out, in terms of meeting our, our, our build-out water demand. And as such, we're able to, you know, kind of limit it to maybe Chimney Hollow and maybe another cost-effective project to get there. That means we're a lot less costly in terms of a, a cost per acre foot of adding a, a new, even if we had safety factors and everything else, we're still gonna be way below these other guys. So that's something that I think during this conversation needs to be part of it to make sure you have the right picture of what are these other numbers. Not just what other projects are they looking at, but what is their what's their planning horizon in terms of being able to have to bring new water supplies on board? It's, well, it's a big factor. Yeah, and that's important because in a, a decade, the whole our whole expectations could have changed. You know, I mean, we know that we're in a pit, in a period of of rapid weather change, and we don't know whether it's going to be stable or not. You know, it, you know, we just we just don't know. We're getting floods in places we never had floods, and droughts in places we never had droughts. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I uh, I guess part of the part of the mental model, whether you would you would model it this much, this far or not, is the difference between the commitment we make when somebody annex. It, you would approve an annexation, you know, in acre feet of water, or what you're going to have to bring us, is the price of the water pegged at the annexation time, where uh, they don't have to have it till they flat. Till they flat, or is the price fixed, or is the price what they what they pay is platted? It's when they flat. It's when they flat. So, so we might, based on changing data, we might raise that fee in lieu, and the Today's annexation might have a higher cost based on future data. Absolutely. Sure. Okay. So, Allison, or oh, sorry, go ahead. Just, just to kind of maybe put it into perspective, a good way to look at, uh, I apologize for going back to the conversation about how much is left. A good way to look at it is um, at, at, at we'll call it build out, kind of like the same planning horizon. Yes. <laughs> the planning horizon. Um, we're going to be about 32,000 acre feet. Um, we, we need a Fermi project is currently planned to be the last little bit of that. And our Fermi of that is a little over 3,000 acre feet. So it's, so to put it in perspective, it's about 10% of our total planning horizon water demand is yet to be met. So yeah. that's, Yes. Yes. Ex you. Except that, and 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 I mean the the city's business leadership is pushing one way. The city's environmental leadership is pushing the other way. That build out could change 
by plus or minus 20 percent depending on which faction wins you know there are people who who want to say let's just refuse those annexations let's not do it you know just leave it out there and and then there are others of course who want to say let's annex it all now and let's look at our infill situation and go with a much higher level of, of urban density than than exists anywhere in Longmont. And like I said, you know, I I'm swagging here, but it could be plus or minus twenty percent. It could be more than that if we change things like height restrictions. Yeah, that's one of the things when we did our future water demand evaluations is density is density is the big thing for us yeah. anymore. We're, you know, we're pretty well surrounded. Yep. Uh, we're not going out much anymore. I mean, there's little there's little grinds. But but what happens in that donut hole? Mm -hmm. um, it, and it's density, density, density. <laughs> yep. And I agree 100. That's and you know you can look at our future water demand evaluation. It has a certain set of assumptions in there, which is mm -hmm. how we came up with the the number for the windy gap Fermi. And uh, um, yeah, mm -hmm. I agree with you. That that could change. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. First of all, what is Sorry. swag? Swag? Yeah, Silly Wild Ask Yes. Oh! <laughs> I, was being, I was saying Kendrick Wild Ask Yes. Okay. That's the engineering. Thank you guys. Um, so, with that out of the way, um, I guess I'm hearing kind of, a, a, a kind of two areas of discussion. One seems like it's really focused on land use planning, planning decisions. Mm -hmm. And one seems really focused on kind of coming up with a very reasonable, justifiable number based on comparisons, based on risk, based on long term planning horizons. And I think that there is a nexus there, but I also think that there may need to be a separation. And I guess the way that I think of it is if there's one of the puzzles, and you've got pieces missing from that puzzle, the parts that are going to be there and then what goes in there is a missing piece to me it would make more sense i'm predicting for strength and zoning plan to have the puzzle piece that best fits in that spot not necessarily a puzzle piece that can meet some sort of a cash and zoning threshold um so i guess while i think that that is something that needs to be taken into consideration i think that the land use planning decision is something that's separate and aside and maybe take the factors that are, are different from what we're considering now, which maybe is a much more discrete issue. With that said, I think looking at the wider perspective of places that are in developing places, like I want to talk Firestone, you know, Tacono, Thunder, places that don't have the kind of awesome planning and foresight that we do have, you know, what, what's their, what are, what are they doing with water? They obviously want to grow, but they don't have a big reservoir. How are they approaching that? I'd also like to look at Aurora. You know, they have a huge growing population, but guess what? Most of their water's on the west slope. How are they approaching that situation? And kind of putting those various parts and expanding our perspective from what we might see as comparable grading wetlands um, for Collins and kind of looking at other municipalities mm -hmm. that maybe have slightly different challenges but seeing how it affects what they're doing yeah i agree with that and i it, just as, as a remark on that I'm, I'm not saying you have to figure it all out i'm not saying that that um all of the political things should really necessarily be on this board's shoulders i'm what i'm saying is realize that that's what you're feeding into that we're you know the place this is all connected and there are, you know there are going to be a lot of questions and i'm encouraging you to have as many answers <laughs> <laughs> you can control the questions marcia <laughs> in fact they have your help also <laughs> well i'll be here you know Tom, what you, you got joe i got one comment after yeah you. i was just i was i mean I, I, um um I think Allison, you're. I'm trying to draw your puzzle piece analogy here, but uh, I don't. I'm no good at puzzles actually. So, um, but I was just thinking, like, I, I think you said something like 
that, that we can't figure out kind of uh, what should go on a particular plot of land based on who can kind of provide the, the cash in or something. And, and, and I think the reverse is also true, right? That, that we don't necessarily, I mean, we're, we're the water board, right? And we're not necessarily concerned with what goes on the plots of land. What we are you know, supposed to determine is basically how much the whoever that entity is should pay for the for the, for the water that they will presumably be using. And I think that at any given moment, this kind of falls back to some of the things that Todd was saying, that at any given moment we can make that assessment based on some kind of planning with respect to just the water, right? Like, okay, what does water cost us today, essentially, and what what justification do we have to be able to kind of like do ourselves uh, on that decision. And so, uh, you know, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to put, I don't, I don't want to be too, too much about this, but like the discussions about what other cities are doing, it might be helpful in my mind. And we might think about building a contingency factor and we might think about like the, the ways in which other cities are doing that. But it, the, the, the amount that they're paying for water isn't necessarily a huge concern to in my view, because it, it really becomes what we are paying for water, right? Like given our circumstances, given our scenario, what is it about our situation that we can justify asking this entity to pay a certain amount for the water that they are that, that they are going to be responsible yeah. for, right? And, and I know it's that specific that's to their system, specific to their to, to their to, to, to our yeah to our situation. system. Right. But, case, but, so. but the question is, is it? Are we being nice or are we charging all the traffic? Right, and that yeah, and I think that that's exactly where the the evaluation yes. has to go. Is like, are we being realistic about the amount that we are right. that, that we're charging? It, if we are, because our situation is just better than everyone else's, well then, that's a huge benefit to the people who live in this community. Community and it encourages things like affordable housing and and the like, right? I mean, presumably, if we planners do their thing, right? Um, but if you know, but if we're not doing it right, right? Because because we're not building a good contingency factor, well then we need to fix that, right? But I, I think that that's where the discussion has to be is about. What? How, how do we justify this price, right? And I, I don't know that we can justify it by saying, "Well, Fort Collins is doing this, so therefore well, we should keep up with them." I, I, I think the board does not have to justify the price, right? The council has to justify the price. So what? What you're doing is is justifying the costs. You know, what's the minimum? How low can it go safely? So, you know, you've got things like when we when we bid the Chimney Hollow Reservoir project, it was gonna cost us this, it's already up to this, and it's a little firmer now, but there's all kinds of contingencies in that quote or in that bid. Um, so what's the worst case scenario? Um, you know, we know the best case scenario is which is you know that nothing else slips, which never happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, so so that's one set of error bars. Um, you know, rainfall and runoff and stuff. Those are other sets of error bars. And 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 I don't know who decides how you know, how um, how we how we incorporate that data into what we have because there are so many unknowns. Well, and actually that's right where I was trying to go with my hopefully last comment. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we've got, we get firming and then we were looking at, in my mind, via the water planning is Union Reservoir Pump Act. And, and I think there's an easy Union Reservoir Pump Act and there's a hard Union Reservoir Pump Act that you're trying to actually take water back up to the treatment plant. It, what, what, what was going through my mind is you start saying, you know, there, there's variability in terms of supply. We're saying there's uncertainty, and Windy Gap may have more uncertainty than other projects. Fine, we can maybe get an estimate or at least put an estimate. Hopefully, Northern can help firm that up. Um, and does that satisfy, you know, Ken saying 32,000, 3,000 acre foot Windy Gap, maybe if you reduce it by 20%, it's 2,500. So we need to build potentially some of the Union Reservoir pump back. At what cost? 
where, where I was going with this is do we spend a little time or make sure we sharpen our pencil so that our swag <laughs> is maybe not as much a swag. We, we got a little better idea of is that $18,000 an acre foot or is that $25,000 or is that $30,000 per acre foot for that next, next level? And then you could also play the demand side of Hey, we're saying there if you're saying the high end is 20 percent increase in, in demand due to more infill and higher density where does that put us in relation to the winnie gut burning project plus you know union reservoir pump back and, and at what cost and where i'm trying to get to is then you have some semblance of hey we're pricing when you got at, at eighteen thousand, and we need to increase it because of the variability in the supply side compared to the rest of the longboat system the union reservoir pump back cost y dollars per acre foot on a per yield basis and, and how do those two compare so that when we're setting it, to Tom's point, we feel confident from the water board's perspective that the cost per acre foot that we're recommending covers. Is gonna cover, correct. exactly, correct. absolutely, all that. But, and, and, but I, I guess where I think we need to, we need to build that, those pieces in that case to the council so they understand kind of the rationale behind what we're suggesting as a, a cash and loot price. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, I, I, I tend to agree with Tom that, you know, if we start looking at what everybody else is doing, you start maybe, you can look at what they're paying and why they're paying those amounts, but it, it doesn't really deal with our circumstance in, in my mind. It gives you kind of a benchmark, but we're dealing with long month situation. It's system, it's growth, you know, it's planning horizon. Those are the situations we're trying to deal with in the context of the recommendation in my mind that this board's making in terms of cash and loot of the city council. If they want to go beyond that, knock yourself out, but I think we've done our job at that point. No, I, I, I agree with that. Um, be aware that they might, um, you know, and a lot of it is going to depend on whether, you know, we want to, we want to finish off our growth early. Um, you know, other cities have really resisted going to a, an urban density kind of a plan. I hope one won't, won't do that, but there are a lot of people in town who want it. Um, so, uh, you know, the things push both ways. You know, it's, it's how, much ca how much cash and loo, uh, you know, cash and loo and density operate independently of each other. You know, we can increase our revenue from the, uh, from, with, with a, a limited number of annexations as fees and loos, and, and, and we can, can kind of, again, here's that word, take a swag at how long before we do the annexation and how long before the platting makes the money come in. Um, but um, but the, the, there's a limit on how much, how many acre feet we can get out of that. And it's not related in any way to how many acre feet feet oh, we need because of our our urban design constraints. So, all right, you know. I, mean, well, I think we've, we've set the stage good hopefully for the next <laughs> discussion. That's why I asked for the numbers. But yeah, I mean, that's okay. <laughs> just a comment on Todd, some of the comments. Your insight on. Yeah, and every one of them has a story, and that's the point is, is if you throw the number out, people go on the number without getting to the underlying reasons. Mm -hmm. yes. And you got if you're going to go down and you're going to throw those numbers out, I think, I mean, Allison, I think you were kind of suggesting this, then you need to go to each one of those, and then you got to dig into why. Yeah. And what's the basis, and how are they getting there, and how much growth are they going to have? Because that all plays into it. Yeah. And versus, you know, I think that's where Tom and where I'm coming from. As long as its own unique situation, so we're trying to, you know, make recommendations to council based on Longmont specific situation, mm -hmm. not what's happening elsewhere. Uh, but you know, I think that will be some of the conversation, and hopefully, setting that recommendation based on specific information. And then as long as we do that, I think we've kind of done our, hopefully done our job in my mind. And then if the council wants to take other things into account, that's their prerogative. But at least we've done what we're supposed to do. So you, are you suggesting that uh, that the fee levels uh, from surrounding cities aren't part of what the data that is brought back at all? Because I guarantee you that question's going to be asked. 
No, I have no problem. We, we have a pretty extensive spreadsheet that has all that. Just needs to be updated. Mm -hmm. and, and in my mind, that's data. I have no problem in bringing data and then I just think the, the only yeah, piece is you need to you need to dig into it enough where it gives the flavor yeah. of why they're doing what they're sure. doing. Yeah, I I would suggest that I mean these these to me are factors, not necessarily an exclusive list. Mm -hmm. I and mean, it seems to me like you can still take into consideration Lomo's unique situation while also looking at discrete numbers. Yeah. Well it is not the board's job is to take all the data and roll it up into a policy. Okay. But what because it, because there is a point at which it is tied to everything else, all the other policies, um, terrifyingly. Um, <laughs> but yeah, okay. I think I think that we like found all the rocks on the playing field. Yeah, we got a whole whole bunch more next month. <laughs> all right. So we'll keep, yeah. keep moving on then. Yeah. So. So we're under 9B, which is a when you get permit project update, Ken? Yeah, um, just real briefly. Um, and it's, luckily, it's construction still going on at the Windy Gap um, Fermi project. I have a couple of pictures here to show you. Um, and uh, go ahead and see. So this is uh, yesterday's picture. Um, you're, you're looking, you're up on the east above it, the right above it, looking down in the valley. Um, you can, each, each one of these pictures you can see it, it's starting to form uh, coming up here. Um, and then uh, uh, they're, they're continuing to, to work on that. Um, and then the next picture um, shows the coffer dam um, so the main dam is right here, and this is the coffer dam, which you have to build a, a dam to protect the dam when you're building it. It does two things. One is if you get a big rainstorm, it won't wash out the dam you're building and, and have a dam safety. The second is um, just normal precipitation and runoff gets intercepted by the coffer dam, gets spiked around the construction site keeps your construction site um, safe and dry. So they actually have to build the coffer dam before they start going up with the main dam. So you can actually start to see um, the coffer dam going in. And then finally, you can see they've cleared the uh, quarry area and they've had, I believe, two blasts on the quarry area. So um, they've actually got the quarry down. I used to know the number, it's like 40, five feet or something to get to the confident rock they want to use to build the dam. But that first rock they remove will be used for road base and you know other other things at the construction site. But uh, you can you can see they've pretty well cleared that quarry area. So the quarry area is a lot easier to see now. So um, that's where they are. Um, the um, other issues the Colorado River Connectivity Channel around the Windy Gap Diversion structure is 60% um, design is done and they hope to have the 90% done by about the end of October, early November. Um, and from that, they'll do the final um, project estimate, which should be done um, by the end of November. So that part of the project is going forward. They've got additional funding for it um, and are still you know, still looking for another three to four to five million dollars for it. But, um, there's um, hopeful that, that the remainder of that will be coming in. I, th I think now that construction started on Chimney Hollow, it's actually made more people comfortable that we'll get the connectivity channel done and a little more enthusiasm towards getting that done as well. So both, both those projects are going, going quite well. And then the last picture um, that I wanted to show you is um, from Bud Rock. We had a uh, forest fire there this last weekend. Um, luckily it was very small, about the size of this room. <laughs> and uh, primarily because our watershed ranger um, happened to be, this has occurred in the Colson Gulch area 
So it's actually on US Forest Service property, right on the west boundary of the Bud Rock Preserve area. And um, he happened to see the smoke. He happened to be back there patrolling right at the perfect time, saw the smoke, got over to this. Um, it was a campfire, and you've got to tell me how somebody was dumb enough to build a campfire <laughs> right there. I mean, <laughs> I mean, obviously somebody really ignorant. <laughs> but um, they were, uh, luckily he was there to, you know, hand, hand sort of sort of dig a little containment line around it, um, and then got, the assistant ranger brought in some uh, firefighting equipment and some water bladder backpacks. And they started working on it and called both uh, high, uh, uh, Big Elk Meadows Fire and Lions Fire. And uh, believe it or not, Lions Fire came in the front by truck. Big Elk Meadows walked down Overland on foot and got there first. <laughs> and because uh, they're real close. Um, but both fire departments showed up and helped finally extinguish it. But, um, it was, I credit our watershed rangers, thank them a lot for, it, the hard part was it happened exactly one year to the day of the Calvary fire. <laughs> uh, so, you know, uh, it, it, uh, uh, and we actually do have a number of those every year, things like that, uh, that uh, luckily, um, you know, one of the advantages of having watershed rangers there seven days a week is to catch this kind of thing. Um, you know, had that blown up and reached the ground and taken off, you were right there at the west side of the So appreciate that they got that done and give them kudos for doing that. So thank you. That's all I have on that. Any questions? Any comments for Canada? Good for us. Good for yeah. the rangers. Yeah. I appreciate that one. Okay, um, we're on, on to item 9C, Water Resources Engineering Projects update, Jason? Yes, thank you. I um, wanted to give you a quick uh, update on uh, two active projects. Uh, so the South St. Green Pipeline pipeline Rehab Project, um, uh, as you know, we've, we've got that cleaned out, hammered, and uh, we're now starting to mobilize. CNL Water Solutions is mobilized as of uh, last Friday. Uh, and we're going to start uh, actually installing those temporary access points and we're going to start lining the pipeline. Um, that'll be from the diversion structure in the creek all the way to the manhole right east of the fire district building. Um, and so that's basically the, the first half of the South State Green Pipeline. And then I've also just uh, issued a change order so that they can begin uh, cleaning and cameraing the second half the part of the South St. Green Pipeline that's located within Highway 66. So we'll have to work with CDOT to get permits and uh, track controls and be a big deal. But um, we're hoping based on some initial evaluations after um, the 2013 floods that that part may have um, not been as damaged as the first half. So the, the first half getting plugged up with all the, the debris and sediment and the the boulders and everything. We're kind of hoping that the last half uh, isn't as bad, but we'll find out and um, we'll adjust accordingly. Um, then the South St. Brain Pipeline, um, South St. Brain Pipeline pump station project, uh, where uh, that pump station is still being uh, manufactured. That has a, a, a delivery date of February 18th, and we're currently working with our consultant to go up and bid. Um, and get a contractor on board. Um, so within the next two weeks or so, we should be advertising uh, uh, for, for the construction portion of that project. Um, that project is, is probably expected to go into June of next year, um, which hopefully by then CDOT will be done with their Highway 7 project. Um, and we can actually turn the South St. Green pipeline back on and get the pump station online. Having said that, um, we'd like to also give you a quick update on the uh, Nelson Flanders Water Treatment Plant Expansion Project. Uh, Larry Wayno, who's the uh, uh, engineering administrator for that project, is here to give you an update on that. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, well, yeah, here we go. Let's start from there. 
So I wanted to give you uh, a brief update and show you exactly where, where, where the project's at. And uh, there are some other related projects that are going on next to that, which I wanted to briefly mention. So if we can go to uh, the first slide. If you look at, there's two yellow dots kind of in the center of that screen. One off to the left is Nelson Flanders. You can see that's labeled there. Uh, Below, uh, to the right of it, is the Wade Gaddis plant. I'm not sure if you all know where the Wade Gaddis plant is. It was built in 1984. It is an older plant. It has, uh, it really is kind of a emergency standby plant at this point because it is uh, pretty much near its useful life, end of its useful life. Uh, the type of, the design of that plant is an older design and it's much harder to meet the, the treatment requirements to run it. So we usually keep it only for uh, emergencies. We do not run it. Uh, we haven't actually run it for a few years. We rely on the Nelson Flanders water treatment plant. And Nelson Flanders, if you look at it, it's north of Highway 66 and just off of North 53rd Street, which is the road to Rabbit Mountain open space. Uh, it does show some of the raw water pipelines that we that deliver water to both treatment plants, actually. Uh, the next slide. So some of the project background, <laughs> the Wade Gaddis plant is rated at 15 MGD. Uh, when we do the expansion, we will be replacing that 15 MGD so that we have uh, a total of around 60 MGD capacity. The existing plant, Nelson Flanders, right now is 40 MGD. So the expansion uh, will happen in two phases. Uh, we actually, once we built the original plant, we did get it permitted through Boulder County through a 1041 process. We were able to get it approved for uh, a maximum capacity of 80 MGD. Uh, this first phase will bring us from 40 to 60 MGD. Uh, so that's uh, currently under design. Uh, the next slide. So we are currently at 30% design right now. Uh, we're using a project delivery method called design build. Uh, a typical project, usually we hire an engineer to design the project. Once it's uh, designed, we go out and bid it out, and then a contract will, will build it. Uh, design build is different and it is a preferred method that we use on very large and complex projects. Uh, what we do is we have one single contract. So the designer or the engineer and the contractor are working together to develop the design and then building it together. It has a lot of advantages. It gives us more flexibility as far as as we're going through design and into construction. Uh, so right now we'll, we're at 30%. <clears throat> we should be finishing up uh, design around the second or third quarter of next year. And then we will start building the project. Uh, we anticipate it'll run to uh, 2024. Uh, the estimated cost right now is around 50 MTD or $50 million. Uh, around 37, 37 and a half is through the water bond election. The next slide. Uh, that shows kind of the, where we are at in design. The building off to the left is the existing plant. Uh, I don't know if you can read the labels there. Yeah, thanks Heather. And then off to the right is the expansion. <laughs> we still have to go through Boulder County to have them review it uh, and to make sure that uh, they uh, find that acceptable. Uh, there are some conditions in our 1041 permit that we have to meet. And so they'll be looking at this proposed design to determine whether we can meet those conditions under our permit, existing permit. Uh, that's off to the upper right, you'll see a small four bay. 
we currently have one form A, which is around uh, 100 acre feet or 30 million gallons. Uh, we will be building a second and smaller form A off to the right there. And that primarily is, will be used for, if we get uh, <coughs> water, raw water that has high turbidity, or it's a cloudier water, we can run it through the form A and that would serve kind of as a settling basin to clarify some of that water before we run it to the plant. So the next slide. <laughs> this is a related project. Uh, we're, one of the reasons why we're doing the expansion in the building is separate from the existing plant is for redundancy and security reasons. Uh, once we decommissioned the Wade Gauss plant, we'll only have one plant that supplies the city. We wanted to have some redundancy so that if something happened to the existing plant, we have the expanded plant that can continue to run. So we basically have two plants at one site. So the one of the things that uh, we're doing is right now we have one primary feed to the plant, an electric feed, uh, we plan on constructing a second electrical primary electrical feed to the plant. So we have redundancy there. So that will be going on at the same time we're building the expansion. And then the next and final uh, related project is Montgomery Tank, which is just south of the Nelson Flanders plant. It's right, uh, you see that small white circle kind of in the lower left side of the uh, picture there. That's right off, the, right at the intersection of Highway 66 and North 53rd Street. <clears throat> that tank needs to be uh, rebuilt. And we're actually looking at some sites that are to the right of that. There's a property that we just purchased to the right of the Montgomery Tank site. And uh, we are going to be working with the Boulder County to see if it might, might be acceptable for us to uh, move our storage tank uh, closer to the plant uh, of the Montgomery property that's to the right of there. And that, I believe, is, yeah, this is kind of a, it's hard to see, but you can kind of see where the existing storage tank is in that photo. <clears throat> and the, uh, right now, the estimated cost for that storage tank is around 15 million or million dollars. Uh, we are doing conceptual planning this year. Next year, we uh, will start doing some design and permitting and then in 2023, 20, 24, uh, trying to rebuild that storage tank. Now, I think that is it. Let me ask you a couple of questions, Larry. Is the existing plant, what's the capacity of that? It's, uh, you know, it was originally designed for 30 MGD, and then we were able to get it re-rated to 40. So right now it could treat 40 million gallons per day. And the new plant, what's the capacity of that? Uh, the, new, the expansion will be another 20 million gallons per day. So total we'll have 60 okay. with both the existing and the expansion. And, you know, just kind of curiosity of it, when they get both plant, the new one up and running, are you gonna try and use both at similar capacities or, you know, I'm just kind of curious how you're going to run those things. Yeah, we will probably uh, try to, we, it's definitely better to try to run the expanded portion of the plant to some level. Uh, you don't want it just sitting there right now. So you would run, they'll probably balance it out some, uh, depending on the time of the year too. Uh, because the summer peak demands are going to be in probably July, August. And we'll definitely be running them both at that time. In the winter time, uh, our demands will probably be around 8 or 10, maybe 12 
million gallons per day. That could be uh, provided by either the existing or the uh, expansion. So it kind of depends on both the manpower required and how efficiently the operations people feel, you know, whether it's better to just run one side or to run both at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. Uh, and this is where the raw water yeah. tour came in really handy. Um, we were fortunate enough to go at two weeks ago. It was, yeah. anyway, it was very helpful. So all the water kind is collected in that little that pump building, the giant green pipes. Is that a bit of is there redundancy for that? That will be uh, I'm not the sure. Blending sure. structure. Blending structure. Yeah. Okay. So Right now, that blending structure receives water from both the Carter Lake connecting pipeline, so it's coming from Carter Lake through the pipeline. Mm -hmm. It also receives water from the St. Brain Supply Canal, and that's during the summertime. It also gets water from the North St. Brain Pipeline that goes up to a Long Run Dam. So we have three separate sources that we can draw on to treat water. In addition to that, if we really need to, we can deliver water through the Highland Ditch and pump water from the Highland Ditch to the plant. Okay. So there's actually four uh, pipelines that we can deliver raw water to. Okay. And that was one of the reasons for siting it, where we did site it, because we had access to several different uh, sources so that, you know, depending on what was happening, and Especially now, I think we've become more critical because of all the wildfire fires that are happening. Yeah. We have the ability to switch sources if we're if one source is being impacted. So it gives us a lot more flexibility. So heaven forbid something happens with the blending, the blending structure. The could be the Highlanders will be the only potential to get water to the. If say that again. If something happens to the, the blending. Structure. 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 Yeah. Would the Highland Ditch be the only avenue by which to get water? To uh, we have a bypass okay. uh, from the uh, blending structure, which we can't uh, bypass water, although it has to go into the blending structure. But uh, yeah, we could get it there. We, we Generally, we can get it to the treatment plants, both of them. And then we also have uh, if it is really an emergency, we have the four bay, the thirty, the, which stores around thirty million gallons. Uh, if something were really severely to go wrong, uh, we would start drawing up the four bay. Uh, but that gives us only a limited supply in time. And assuming that we we could address whatever the problem was, but for the most part, because we're flowing by gravity into the plant there's not a lot that can go wrong unless there was you know some, some nefarious act some type of terrorism um, that is the other thing uh, with this site is we're trying to consolidate things so that we can se secure all of our facilities in that area and that's one of the reasons also for trying to move the storage tank Montgomery tank away from the highway the highway is uh, the storage tank is really easily accessible by the public, public because it's right next to the a major highway. So if we can move that further away, we believe that would be a, a more secure location. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The the second four bay, um, you you mentioned it being able to be kind of uh, a, a bit of kind of settling uh, process there. Right. But was that purposeful? Was that because of, you mentioned wildfire, for example, was uh, that because you see problems in the future with wildfire or was that just, well, it's an extra benefit or something? It, it is really because of what we've seen with wildfires. Right. Um, one of the things that happened with Fort Collins when, when they had a wildfire out of, uh, in the uh, watershed, is uh, they they got a lot of sediment 
because of the bare ground. There's a lot of ash that came down. The ash is very difficult to treat, even with a settling pond. So there will probably need to be other uh, chemicals that need to be added. But long term wise, after a wildfire, there still are other impacts that occur because of the change in the, the ground and um, just the whole change in that area. So there are other things. Uh, that smaller basin, if we need to, we, we could probably add chemicals to that to help. Mm -hmm. One last question, Larry. You were saying you're going up to 60 MDD on this. What's Longmont's current peak for the year? And then what have you seen over the last few years with regards? I mean, we've talked about the per capita usage is right. going down, but mm -hmm. what are you seeing in terms of peak demands in relation to the capacity of the plant? Yeah, we refer to that as the max day, maximum yeah. day demand. Yeah. And it's probably around 30. Low, the low 30s. Surprisingly, the highest maximum day we, or one of the highest maximum days we've had was in around 1998, I believe, was a really high day. And I believe that was 34 million gallons per day. Uh, it stayed, the peak, those max days have stayed around that, that level for a while. Uh, and it's surprising because we see the same thing at our wastewater plant, uh, even with the growth that occurs, our, the flows that are going to the wastewater plant have been fairly low for the last five, five or more years. So it hasn't gone up yet, but it will start to go up because there's only a certain, you know, amount of conservation or whatever is occurring, but it does, occurred throughout most of the metro area. Most of the other cities are seeing the same thing. But at the current rate and the way you're growing, I mean, the 60 MDD may, may even over time planning horizon or earlier. Yes. That may get you to build out and you got the potential to go to 80 with the county. So right, looks like you're you're covered in the context of that plant and being able to satisfy. Yeah, you know, that, that it's, we think that it will, uh, satisfy our needs through the planning horizon. The one thing about long-term projections is they are long-term projections and, and they keep on changing over time. Um, one of the concerns that, uh, or one of the issues that could change how that changes it in the future is how development is occurring because we are seeing very, a lot more dense developments occurring. So at some point that will start to uh, to impact what, what happens in there. Okay, great. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Great. Thank you for the. That was great. That was yeah. Really good yeah. report. Thank you, Larry. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate it. All right. Let's keep on moving here. We're on item ten. Items from the board. The first item is ten A, the remote attendance policy. Ken. And, and we really don't have much to report on that today. We're still working with, we haven't had a chance to sit down with legal to craft the language, so but we intend on having that for your November board meeting. So okay. All right. back. Any comments there? Otherwise, we'll just revisit. We'll take it up again in November. Um, item 10B is the review of major project listings that's in your packet. Um, and I, items 10 are least scheduled for future board meetings. Any comments on? What's coming up? Don't see any. Um, 11 is informational items and water board cor correspondence. There's a few items attached in the packet. Any questions, comments on that? I don't see any. Um, items tentatively scheduled for future board meetings. We have the cash and lieu, and obviously, the next time we set it is December, but we'll be talking about it in November in a lot more detail. Um, and um, <clears throat> item 12B is discuss future water board agenda. Anything anybody wants to bring up for future agendas? You know, one thing, this might, I, I was going to ask a question with Excel. What's the termination date of the existing contract? Is that out a couple of years yet? Well, um, that's like 50 more years. <laughs> huh? It, it was a 75 year contract they entered into. In, Oh, three, so it's like 2070. We're in it for some reason. I thought we had a couple, three years 
some piece of it. But, uh, well, there is a, an opt-out provision, isn't there? Yeah, there's a 15-year opt-out. So if they chose to opt-out or we chose to opt-out, it's 15 years from when we yeah. either party gives each other notice. But we, but you're you're correct. We we do hope to um, go back to public service and, and basically either extend or make permanent that exchange agreement. And that is the one, yeah, that's exactly, we're remembering. Um, we are in the process. We have the language written. I'm just trying to, it's being reviewed. Um, okay. And once it's approved, I'll, okay. I'll send that out. I'm just kind of curious. So that's right. a thanks. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Great. Anything else? I don't see anything with that. We're on to item 13. And um, I'm going to go ahead and adjourn the meeting. So thank you all for your time today. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's like Charlie's angel. Don't see what you look like. Thank you. Uh, 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 we're going to give you like.